Now here is a story that uh, I've got a couple of these will piggyback one on another. And this is why this election is the most important one in our lifetime or many, for many lifetimes here in America. Blue State Blues. Once socialism gets in, you can never vote it out. That's the title of this article. Boy, isn't that the truth. Joe Biden says, I'm not a socialist. I beat the socialist. He won the nomination for president, but as Crazy Bernie declared in April, we have won the ideological battle. Biden is the liberal figurehead of what has become a socialist party. Biden's platform is the Biden Crazy Bernie Unity Task Force. It's a manifesto for state domination of the economy. And that's socialism. You don't let the people determine, you let the state determine. Even Biden's rhetoric calling for a revolution to fundamentally transform America is a socialist call. Ah, uh, but this socialism isn't going to be like Soviet communism, we are told. This is democratic socialism. Uh, that is, we still have the vote and our civil liberties. But as F.A. Hayek argued last century in the, his book, The Road to Serfdom, S-E-R-F, not, not talking about the beach there, but talk about serfdom, uh, you cannot preserve individual freedom if the state controls your most basic economic choices. Let me read that again. This is so, this is profound. You cannot preserve economic freedom, individual freedom, if the state controls your most basic economic choices. We have seen for ourselves, once Obama guaranteed health insurance, Catholic nuns had to go to court to preserve their basic religious rights. Moreover, what the Democratic Party has planned is fundamentally undemocratic. They rejected the last Democratic election. Like Mike Pence said on this debate with Kamala Harris, talk about this election, the results, uh, you, know, you know, questioning the results. He said, you guys are still questioning the results of 2016. You never got over that. Now, <laughs> if they win in 2020, and here's the key, and this is so, so important. Another story, uh, I'm going to piggyback on this. If they win in 2020, they intend to rig the system so they can never lose again. Well, how are they going to do it? Well, they want to admit D.C. and Puerto Rico as states, creating a permanent Senate majority. Remember, each state gets two senators. That's four more senators. Uh, so you've got, you know, Puerto Rico and D.C., like 90 percent of D.C. is Democratic. A great majority of the people of Puerto Rico are, too. So that'd be, you know, four more senators in perpetuity there. They will kill the filibuster where, you know, filibuster is where, you know, the opposite party can keep talking and talking and, you know, draw out the possibility for a vote. No, no, we'll just kill that idea. They will pass amnesty and create millions of new Democratic voters. Finally, they will pack the court with liberals to overriding any checks on their power. Former President Barack Hussein Obama cast these changes as necessary to overcome the legacy of systemic racism at John Lewis's funeral in July. Obama cast the filibuster, which he himself used, as a relic of the Jim Crow era. Remember, Jim Crow was a, um, a minstrel character, an apocryphal minstrel character, who was, um, you know, um, the laws that were passed are called were after the Civil War Jim Crow laws. In other words, uh, although we had President Lincoln, a Republican, free the slaves, the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation, there were laws that were passed that basically did not allow that to happen. In other words, um, yes, the slaves are free, but they had to do A, B, C, and D. And, and again, it was totally unworkable. In other words, they passed these laws that didn't allow the, the slaves to become free. And the, the terrible thing is many of these Jim Crow laws were still in effect in the 1960s when I was growing up. And it was interesting, you know, hearing about them for the first time and wondering, really, you got to be kidding me because... Where I grew up, where I was from, we didn't see this sort of, um, you know, racism that was there in so many different places. Like I've, t I've talked about before, the smartest kid in our school, Kenny Johnson, was an African-American, a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, we only had a couple uh, in uh, this time in Orange County in the 60s, 60, 66, 67, 68. But, uh, you know, everybody loved Kenny. He's a great guy. And I don't know anybody. And, again, I was there for four years. He was a year ahead of me, three years at Kenny. Everybody liked the guy. They didn't care about the color of his skin. He's a sharp guy. He's very smart. We all learned from him. When he would talk, it's like you lean forward. His, his father was actually the assistant secretary of the Navy. And so, um, you know, what's this racism stuff? you got a guy smarter than most of us. But bottom line is, um, and today, here we are in, in 2020, and they say systemic racism. Uh, let's go back on the list again. The chief of police in Seattle, until she resigned because she didn't have the, the, the leftist board of supervisors behind her, African-American female. The mayor, Atlanta, Georgia, African-American female. 
Chicago, Illinois, Washington, D.C., African-American female, all. And so uh, where else? Uh, uh, Rochester, New York. We can go on and on and on. So come on. Uh, there's opportunity there. This is the land of opportunity. If you can do the job and you're good, you will get voted in. And that's the thing. Now, if you don't do good, you could get voted out and you should. But there are wonderful people of every conceivable color running different you know, businesses, running po political uh, you know, institutions, this and that. The best person ought to be able the person that does it. And if the game is, you know, if the game isn't fixed and it's there's not this systemic, we won't have a male, you know, it's in the old days, well, we've got to have only white males. In fact, it is interesting growing up because I remember in um, civics class, <laughs> this shows you how different it was then. The Supreme Court was always called the nine old men. In other words, the nine old white men, because they were white men. And then, of course, we had some, like Thurgood Marshall, some African Americans get on the Supreme Court, and Sandra Day O'Connor females. And now you, you know, have uh, Amy Coney Barrett will be what the got her, Ellen Kagan, and uh, uh, Son Sotomayor, and that on the Supreme Court. So it'll be three females. My math is correct right now. I'm not forgetting, buddy, am I? Uh, anyway, bottom line is, so there'll be four females, three. Three Democrats and one Republican there, if my math is uh, correct here. But the bottom line is things have changed, and there, you know, there's, there's uh, people are more open-minded. You, you know, we're raised, and we went through that in the '60s. Those of us growing up as kids in the 60s, didn't like what our parents and grandparents were telling us about that. And so we rebelled against that. You know, what? The, what's the difference? Why does the skin color mean anything? And of course, as you read the Bible, the uh, Bible says we're all one blood, uh, uh, Acts 17. We all came from one one family, you know, and that's what Paul said on the Areopagus there in Mars Hill. God has made, you know, many nations, many people, but all from one blood, from the original parents, Adam and Eve. So anyway, You've got uh, Biden now is trying to cast Donald Trump as a white supremacist champion, though Biden's hoax claim about the neo-Nazis imploded when Mike Pence fact-checked Kamala Harris on stage. And uh, the author here, this is uh, Joel Pollack from uh, Breitbart. It's really interesting, his testimony here, his story. He said, I was born in a white, he's Jewish, by the way, I was born in a white supremacist country, South Africa. My parents emigrated to the U.S. shortly after I was born. They didn't want to raise their kids in a racist society and thought it would be only, ch only change could be through violent revolution. As it turned out, South Africa's transition was peaceful. Even before black South Africans had the vote, whites voted two to one to approve the apartheid government's negotiations with Nelson Mandela towards a non-racial democratic future. He said, I went back to South Africa as a graduate student, and it confirmed leftists enthusiastic about the socialist nature of South Africa's new constitution, which provided socioeconomic rights for the basic necessities like health care. What I learned was jarring. Not only did socialism make people worse off, it was impossible to get rid of. Let's say that again to the American people. Socialism not only makes people worse off, which it does, it was impossible to get rid of. And this is the worrisome thing here. In three weeks, it's very possible that this country will vote in a socialist. Um, Joe Biden is, you know, is, being promo is being pushed, put forward by socialists. But we saw uh, Nancy Pelosi last week uh, trying to uh, get, ram through this 25th Amendment idea of making sure the person in the White House is mentally capable, mentally stable of handling the job. And as Donald Trump said, that's not about him. That's about Joe Biden, because as soon as Biden, if he got in um, fairly soon, they would be saying, you know, Joe was really sharp and doing really good during the campaign. But we did see him deteriorate a bit. But now.